All right, it looks like we have a 26 point agenda. Uh, item number two, approved notice of posting was properly posted. All right. And then, as I said, we have a 26 point agenda. I am going to move things around a little bit. Um, after the corner update, I'm probably going to skip down to 22 radio tower project updates so that our administrator and Mike Day can get on with the rest of their day without having to sit through a rather lengthy meeting that this is probably going to be. So, um, all right, so I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Frank. Second. Second by McKee. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Opposed? All right, we have an agenda. Item number four, minutes from the March 3rd, 2023 public safety meeting. Any questions, comments, discussion? Well, actually, we should get it on the floor first. I would entertain a motion. Motion by Frank. Second by Severson. Any discussion on those minutes? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Can everyone at least say aye? Over there. <laughs> uh, all right, opposed? All right, minutes are approved. Item number five, Driftless Music Gardens event updates. Who would like to start? If you want to, if you want to take a mic, could you, can you give her the mic? Thank you for having us. Um, I'm Cricket Lochner with Driftless Music Gardens, and we are under the ordinance, so we are just here for transparency purposes and to answer any questions that you guys may have in regards to the events that we offer. Um, we have three upcoming events this summer, one in June and one in July and one in August. Um, so far, our experience over the last eight years, this will be our eighth season, and things have been running rather smooth, no incidents um, worth noting. And I ask of you if there's any concerns or questions that you have for Driftless Music Gardens. So I don't know, I think most, well, maybe Barb and um, maybe you I weren't here last year, but this is something that, like she said, that they've done for the last eight years. This is and, our eight and we have, we approve because it's a large gathering. So we have to, if you want to just give a little background on why we're talking about this. And I think, I think what Cricket was saying too, is they do fall under okay. the required amounts of people for large group ordinance, but she does like to right. keep us informed on what's going on. Um, and I, I guess I, myself don't really have much concerns. We haven't had any issues with their events. And so, well, and they bring a lot of people to the they area, bring a lot of people to the area. Yeah. And you, to keep on expanding that too. Do you guys put extra people on, on the weekends? Um, or? We don't necessarily staff extra for it. You just, so if you have to respond. Have to, yeah. Okay. Yep. Does anyone have any questions? Sorry. Yeah. How many people come? What's your attendance? Um, well, on that first. Yeah, with sorry. COVID, um, <laughs> things have changed. Uh, we were right under a thousand prior to COVID, and then with COVID, uh, we had to take some pivoted um, business movements, and we were at like, as you can see in the, it's on page three or page two of their. During COVID, we had roughly. A, average attendees of like 300 to 450 um, attendees. And then as 21 came, uh, we grew a little bit more. We had many less events um, because COVID, we did the drive-in aspect of things. And then 21, we sort of went back into normalcy. And 22, we had just the four weekends and our largest event that we had uh, was when we had a single event uh, where we had trampled by turtles come out and we had roughly 1600 headcount on site. Um, that has been our biggest event to date, um, but we are throwing festivals this year and. We know that will roughly be right around a thousand. We hope on a positive note that we get close to 1600, but we'll see how those ticket 
sales come in. Um, so growth is still slow, but we are um, reaching our reach is all across the nation. So we are bringing people from the West Coast, East Coast, down in Florida, um, all over to come to our little neck of the woods here. Um, so it, fingers crossed that we have another great season and that puts us into a positive spin for next year. Uh, but we're hopeful and things are going well that we'll have a good turnout this year. We will not hit our capacity, um, but we do plan on having a good successful year. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for doing this. Any other questions? So are we needing action? Do we need to approve? Um, or it's just an informational only, correct? Informational only. Okay. All right, thank you for your time yeah. today. Thank, thank you. you for coming in. All right, that brings us to corner updates, which if we did, if you want to just run through it, he did put it in our iPads, but. Um, yes, so uh, the corner report, March was a difficult month for our office with three accidental deaths. One is a suspected accidental overdose. Uh, final death cause is pending toxicology. The second involved a fatality in a house fire, and the third was a fatality in a logging incident. Uh, there were 11 calls total for the month, with the sedents ranging in age from 38 to 87 years of age. Of these cases, three were accidental deaths. One cause of death was dementia, two were cancer deaths, and five were heart-related deaths. Of the 11 calls for the month, eight were cremations. In comparison, the office had 17 calls in March of 2022. We're at 35 cases total for the year, and we are at 37 cases. We were at 37 cases the same time last year. At the time he wrote this, uh, they had no cases thus far for April. So that was on the 6th. As always, please reach out if you have any questions. Respectfully, Jim Rosen. All right, thank you. All right, so now I'm going to skip down to item number 22, radio tower project updates. Um, I'm not sure Mike wants to start or Clint wants to start. I can start with a real quick summary if that of the project, if that works. Yep, that sounds good. Okay. Um, yeah, good morning. Um, again, Mike Day with True North County's consultant on the radio project. A um, couple of, uh, of recent things that, uh, that I want to pass along, I guess, is uh, um, we did get uh, some of the radio console training this week. And so um, things are, are moving ahead here and we're looking at a, uh, a target date to cut over um, the radio consoles in the dispatch center. Um, approximately the 26th, so a couple of weeks from now. So um, again, that replaces the old radio consoles and and, uh, and gets the county working on, on the new um, system there. And then um, on the um, off-shoot project, kind of the security project that we're also tracking here, um, we've got the that RF uh, be on, on uh, the streets and uh, we'd, we were having a, uh, a um uh, a um pre bid call this week, but that uh, got bumped. We had a technical um, difficulty, so we hope to have that next week. And those responses are due on the 11th of May, so um, should get that information. So I guess moving on to the radio system, the the design is is really holding um, on the the nine sites that uh, we initially um, anticipated. Um, we're we're really not doing too much changing on the the design itself of the radio system. We've really settled in on the areas that uh, we're trying to cover. So um, things are are, are kind of holding steady there, and we're really waiting to to finalize some site acquisitions. So our next big thing with uh, the design there is is the detailed design review from the radio vendor, and uh, we've we've currently got that on a target date around the 22nd of May. Um, of course, uh, that uh, once we complete that and, and the county signs off on that, that that does become the next milestone payment um, to the radio vendor. So um, we, we're kind of working that in with uh, with your borrowing uh, timeline as well. So 
Mike, can I ask a quick question? Yep. Where are we on the final number of greenfield sites? How many? We are. I would say we're not. Uh, we're not solid on anything yet. We've. We've. We're currently holding. We've got uh, five lease sites, and so four greenfield sites. Um, but we 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 still have a little of a hurdle on uh, on our lease site. So um, that that I guess is the area that I was going to touch on next. Um, the site acquisition. Um, again, with maybe with greenfield sites, we've got uh, two um, landowner sites that I think we have pretty good news on here um, this week recently. Um, we, we really have verbal commitments, so we just need to kind of finalize a, a letter of intent with those landowners that would, uh, kind of put to rest, um, our greenfield sites and, uh, you know, at least getting them to, uh, so we can do the engineering work on them and the, and the, um, um, regulatory work on them. And then, uh, our big, our big standout with lease sites is us cellular. Um, we really had some challenges there. Um, we, they've got us working with, um, an agent that, that does their property work. Um, the agent has given us some, um, some, what they call their standard, uh, us cellular rates based on what we want to put on the towers. Of course, that certainly, um, did not look very good. Um, I, I don't know if folks remember talking about some of the other, um, Mobility, I think, was the other lease tower sites we were looking at, and we we got some rates that were really unfavorable there as well. So um, right now it's it's back to U.S. Cellular. Um, you know the their their agent has asked them to uh, consider or what they what they want to do to consider uh, public safety rates, and so we're we're waiting on a response from U.S. Cellular itself back to to them to their agent. And then, um, we, we are also certainly kind of looking ahead because, um, 1 of the new sites that we have for us cellular, um, you know, we're looking at options there. If, if they do hold firm to some, um, ridiculous, uh, high number that, uh, you know, really wouldn't be something the county would want to consider. Um, you know, another, it, question, uh, Mike. Mm -hmm. another question. So. I know that there was discussion of contacting Mark line and some of our representatives have any of them responded and or been helpful with trying to communicate the importance of. US cellular not being so greedy. Put it bluntly. I can speak to that Madam chair. We did reach out. Um, we had representation from Senator Mark lines office that came back and got us connected with some folks from US cellular. Same kind of folks. So. Passed us kind of back on to Pinnacle, which is the contracting agent uh, that works on behalf of you. So it didn't help at all. No, not in leverage. I mean, leverage. right. What what are they charging? What are they saying they're going to charge per month? Well, the 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 challenging one, of course, is the the new site we want to we wanted to anticipate using was Boaz, and again, that one came back similar to the mobility rates. Of fifty thousand dollars a year, and again, I I can tell you that we could build a greenfield site within you know four years right. of that kind of lease rate. So you, you know you you wouldn't want to entertain that. <laughs> but um, and we've looked at a couple options, but yeah, I think um, there's still again we're working with the agent, so there's still the misunderstanding about the Richland Center site. And and we um, have, are, are trying to engage the city on that, so we make sure we're on stable ground with um, that that contract being basically a pass through um, to allow the the county on the site. But we still need everybody to kind of sign off on these things because we're we're definitely putting more equipment on that tower, and so um, the challenge really right now is getting. And we've requested it from Pyramid, the, the the leasing agent, just to try and have a a meeting, a discussion meeting. Um, but they're they're really looking for some response from U.S. Cellular, and so that's kind of where things stand right now. Um, we we will go ahead. What is the plan if U.S. Cellular does not come down in their price? 
I, I think the plan for, the plan for Boaz would be a greenfield site. Um, I don't know if we're really, you know, Rich, again, Richland Center is not is a key site for us, and uh, you know, not anticipated to be um, any cost at all. But we still need them to kind of check the box and tell us, yeah, uh, go ahead and and you know. Um, they they need to support the uh, the um, the engineering aspects of that work. So they need to kind of understand what we want to put up there and, and agree that it can go up on the tower. And I'm sure they're going to probably want to rewrite some type of agreement. And and of course you would want that agreement as well, so that it it states you know all the the new aspects of the design. So there's a, there's some work to do, but. Uh, yeah, we I don't know if we've considered giving up that site or even the the Muscaday site to the south, which is where you're already leasing as well. And we're just so hoping for a, a fa more favorable response from them. The Richland Center site, is that WRCO or is that also US Cellular? That's US Cellular. It's US Cellular. Oh, it is US Cellular? Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, currently right now there's a lease agreement, long-term lease, but it's up in... 26 uh and up for renewal it's tower hill that we're talking it's tower about. hill oh, yeah okay yep all right yeah looking for something some good news from them um again it's you know it's it's not gonna it's not gonna hold it's holding us up a little bit but it's not holding up um things because uh, ultimately they're they're gonna do most of that work um engineering wise so we we turning to that piece of it we do have an engineer um involved in the project now um and we've got uh we've got them looking at some of the uh um preliminary uh uh regulatory and and uh, understandings um at some of the sites we we have kind of given them a little bit of a green light on some of the sites, but we have to be pretty careful. Um, again, you know, not not being sure that uh, one of these other sites would fall out. We don't want them to go too far um, and invest too much time and 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 energy into um, sites that uh, that could be impacted. So um, they've just started that work, but uh, yeah, we certainly hope to get things moving a little bit more. Um, with the engineering aspects of of these sites as well, so. So, are you still anticipating that you are going to have some? I mean, I I thought we had some solid numbers we were going to talk about today as far as what we want to borrow, but how we, can we, we have solid numbers if we don't know how many towers we're building? I would describe them as updated numbers, but we we certainly don't have. We certainly have a couple of budgetary. Um, considerations on these numbers. So, and I can point those out. Um, yeah, the 2 things that I, I would say there is we have is, uh, we've got, uh, we're still holding on the, the budgetary number for the security project, but, uh, again, in reviewing the design that's that's being, um. Re released in the request. Um, we're, we're confident that that number really hasn't changed from our original projection. Um, on the, uh, the radio side of things, we've, we've updated the numbers on, um, the civil costs. And so that's, that's changed and reflected, um, the greenfield sites that we're anticipating, but again, anticipating, um, the 3 sites from us cellular being part of that. And so that certainly has changed in in the overall costs uh, of the original projection, um, and and we've kind of moved that. I think um, some uh, some of the monies around that we had anticipated for both subscribers and maybe even um, into some of the contingency money um, to come up with our new number. Um, but again, we're still kind of within that that original budget, and so. Um, no, no, no overall change, I guess, is what I would what I would say with the, uh, the budget number. And, and I think Clint's going to probably speak to that a little bit more. The, the final 2 things that I'll touch on, um. Timeline wise is, uh, is just that, uh, again, the DDR, 
um, coming up in May that will really um, allow the radio vendor to order um, equipment. And then the final thing, um, just uh, again, thinking about the, the civil piece of it and understanding um, when that, that information might come, um, you know, we're probably looking at a, an actual civil bid release, um, definitely uh, in later this, this summer, um, July would be early, I would think August or, or after that. So we we'll, we will probably better understand the actual civil numbers um, in that time frame once that bid is released and we receive responses from it. So that's kind of the timeline going forward. And again, again with the the security thing, we should we should understand that piece of it and firm that number up again. Not as not as big. So uh, firm that number up um, when we get responses in May. So. Questions for me? Oh, you can hang around while Clint's talking in case yeah. we do have more questions. Oh, sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, to kind of, um, I should be sharing here up on this. Can you see that? Yep. Zoom it in. That may be one more click. One second here. Oh, that's too far. Back up. Okay, so these are the numbers that we worked through with Mike. Um, the Column C or budget is kind of what we were projecting on it earlier in the project. And this is kind of what we used as the benchmarks in for doing the authorization resolution. So remember the county board is approved by three quarters vote in authorization resolution of about $8.5 million. And it was kind of set all on the numbers on column C or the budget. Uh, where we're at right now is our current numbers. Uh, so kind of walking through that, uh, you're going to see some uh, some of the impacts that we have on the two different types of numbers there. The first one noticeable up in the radio vendor system totals is the the decrease from you know, 4.4 4 and change to 2.3, and that's the decision on taking out uh, 1.4 that we had for the subscriber radio equipments uh, that we were going to try to do a potential mass type of purchase. Now, since then too, though, we've put in about 222,000 kind of in that number to cover uh, our sheriff's department and to also cover uh, for our ambulance, uh, our own ambulance uh, services in the event that the grant were to not go in, in, in effect. So there's where we have a significant reduction. Uh, some of those or some of those reductions though, as you see kind of though, get, um, get utilized though for increased civil vendor totals that you'll see down on nine, line 19. So we're anticipating having more green field or fill sites. I get that field, field. field green field sites uh, from an operational perspective um, to also consider as the many conversations we've had with finance and personnel building sites is going to impact your debt services amount, which you have more capacity in than your operations. So with this plan, I think we plan on having some of the funds go out for some extended type of contracts, but in the long term scheme, uh, the county, unless you want to do redu reductions and other operational expenses for other types of services, you have capacity in your debt service bucket, if you will, more though than you have in your operational types of uh, funds. So kind of coming then down through the, uh, the contingency element, we still have a built in projected recommended contingency in these numbers that can be utilized for uh, unforeseen added expenses, including the, the field sites, um, the change in the, from the initial, uh, the initial projections from 8.3 is now more closer to like a 7.9 or so here that you'll see on the, on the final uh, number here. So we've had lengthy conversation with this group and the county board on not wanting to uh, bond more and commit taxpayers to more funds than necessary kind of with this project. At the same time, it's also kind of recommended with not having all the, the sites and such firmed up as well as not knowing what's going to happen with the radio grant and these other elements that we're waiting on to finish through the project uh, that we move forward with an 8.1 million bonded. That's going to give you your contingency amount uh, that you see annotated in here of uh, 767 in uh, the two different types there for the radio contract contingency as, as well as your civil work. And then it's going to give the county uh, roughly an extra 200 and, oh, oh, no, oh, where's my number? 
uh, roughly about 226,000 and then additional funds. Now your authorization resolution two is, is expanded where it can be put towards other county capital improvement projects. Um, so in the event that uh, you're still under, you can apply it towards building maintenances and computer maintenances and fleet management and those other types of aspects. Um, the other talking component that we talked about this is uh, well, kind of in looking at the timeline, this we've got things in place now to do the bonding effective county board meeting in May to sell the bonds and procure the funds on June 15th. That would start the timeline for your 18th month window and talking with Mike and Farb and folks uh, last week or no this week yet on Wednesday, that timeline is still feasible. Uh, we plan on getting civil work contract lined up and executed uh, throughout heavily through the summer next year and be complete then by the time frame. If we are approaching the end of that, we've talked on mechanisms of ensuring that the, the funds are expended and um, and making it work. So everything is in place for an 8.1 million borrowing to be executed by the county board in May with funds received on June 15th. Um, we're working with Carol Worth extensively yesterday, myself and Derek and uh, support from staff and several departments put together the due diligence report. Uh, things are being sent off to bond council and strongly encouraging that this uh, committee today makes resolution to the county board uh, to engage in bonding at an $8.1 million uh, bond. Madam Chair. Mr. Searson, did you have questions you wanted to ask? You know? More or less comments, and I'm just appalled that U.S. Cellular would do something for such right. a public safety event. And the given that Homeland Security was uh, a top of the priority back in the early 2000s, so I, I see this as a Homeland Security issue, not being able to page out our fire departments or have them respond to any emergencies or EMS and have law enforcement there for some type of an attack of any sort. Um, that Boaz Tower site that you're talking about, is that just right outside Boaz there? It's a kitty corner by the country store. Yeah, just, just to the west, yep, up on the hill. Yeah, so I wonder if we can talk to the land owner that that tower is sitting on and tell them our our uh, situation that we have, and maybe that landowner could put pressure on the person that's giving him rent for a few thousand dollars uh, a month or a year to rent that, and how they're making bank off of our public off of his public safety that he has here. So I don't know if we can maybe want to. Contract, Nice. Most of them are all leased that I'm getting on. Yeah, I think I think typically they're on leased property. We could go to the register property. dude's office and pull that yeah. parcel up and see. Then the other thing, the other side of it too, is is are they mid are they mid lease or are they you know, so you know it that's that's where my comment with the city's the lease with the city land is coming up soon and it might be yeah. a good time to open those discussions with us. Uh what? looking at potentially a different lease rate on the hill. So what's our uh, situation far as zoning wise with all these towers? Like do they got to come back and do a renewal process or I, so. I know that that you're not allowed to say no because it's an eyesore and this and that. But the way around a lot of that is you just don't take action on it. That's your only alternative. And so we allow them to have this permit to put this tower up and for peanuts that we give them this permit for, and now they're doing this for us. I think we need to reevaluate that in zoning on these next towers that come up if they're not willing to work I on a public safety aspect. If we were a private yeah. business, I'd understand where maybe they could get that, but I'm just appalled by that. And secondly, I, I've been in contact with mobility on my own personal issues, so I have a, a person there that I've been talking to, and she does all their leasing stuff, so I'm all Maybe I can give you that name and we can go from there. She's been seemed to be pretty cooperative with me. I, I mean, I have. I can remember several times in the last since I've been on county board where. Multiple times I've heard that US cellular and all of the tower people are friendly to public safety that they want to provide blah, blah, blah. That's just a bargaining for you. Right. It, it just for us to get the towers up. I do feel I kind of feel 
like we were, so they can yeah, like milk. we were hoodwinked. Yeah, yeah I know. It's it's very disappointing. Um, yeah, I mean, so part of me was thinking that I'm I might write up a new like FAQ document just talking about because people are going to wonder why we're building all these tower sites. And just for the committee, just one positive of building more greenfield sites is we can then lease it out space to other people, and so they can actually be an income, a revenue stream, which is great. But it's still, you know, how do people are going to wonder why we're building towers when there's a tower, you know, a mile down the well, road? I hope that if if the village of Viola's police department decided to put up or I want to have a repeater on one of our towers in some area that we wouldn't charge them fifty thousand dollars. Put that up there that we can maybe work out a deal with them for public safety aspect, you know, by doing that. Um, I I agree with what uh, um, Darren talked about at our last meeting, getting hold of Ron Johnson. If our friend Howard is not willing to, well, I guess he did help us. He gave us information that we already knew, so that was good of him. I'm glad that he did that. But uh, if maybe. Ron Johnson or the Smalley Bain from Van Orden's office. She was here yesterday at Health and Human Services meeting. Maybe we can reach out to her. Maybe he can help us with talking. About right. I mean, I don't want to do anything to like make it worse, but I don't, can we make it worse? I'm not sure. I, I don't I, know if we have time. That's my concern. Well, mine too, but, but we can't. I mean, are they just waiting us out until they know we have no choice but to move forward? I mean, yeah. I guess my hope is that since we're engaging U.S. Cellular again, because I mean, my attempts to communicate with U.S. Cellular were the same as everybody else's. They just pump me back to Pyramid and say, this is who you talk to. Um, but I think we're actually going to engage U.S. Cellular in the conversation now. So I'm hoping that that will work more favorably for us instead of Pyramid, who kind of sticks to, I'm guessing, what their guidelines are. And yeah. All right. All right. So, oh, go ahead, Mike. Um, I just added a couple of things to that that conversation. Um, yeah, yeah. Certainly, I think, and and the, you know, the group agrees that we we think the Richland Center site with with U.S. Cellular having a, a, a lease with the city and and potentially even having to update that lease. We think that's a huge leverage piece. And and I know um, Clint's reached out to the city, but uh, we really want to try and kind of emphasize that to us cellular so that they understand if if you know if if they stick to high numbers with us then you know the city could stick to high numbers with them too but um the other piece that that I'll throw out to the group just um something that we've kind of discussed on our project calls recently is knowing that the the state of Wisconsin is is looking to change out their radio system and it's probably they're probably a long ways behind you folks, but um, any any effort or any understanding that they would have of of sites that Richland County is building that they could then use in their new radio system if they have uh, a need for additional sites in areas that we know are are very challenging to have sites in now, and and that's the reason why the county's putting up. Um, Towers um, that could also be a benefit to both the state and to Richland County that that those are are planned to uh, to kind of co-locate um, the state in the future. So just a just a thought there if, if anybody's got any connections um, at the state level too. Uh, Mike, this is Bob. So if if the county builds a green field and if the county rents out green fields to other agencies, what type of uh, greenfield changes need to be built to that structure for strength, for future power, for future building. Because uh, just putting it, putting up a greenfield for the county and then anticipating we can add other pieces of equipment is not realistic. Right. That, that that'll we usually make some of those determinations as we get later on in the engineering process, but certainly the biggest one. The biggest concern there would be building a tower that um, is just high enough to uh, to support your um, your equipment, and then you know maybe not having the vertical space to add too much more, um, or or if somebody else came in and needed the tower to be taller, you know, then it's really kind of out of their um, uh, 
their anticipation of using the site if it's not to high enough um, heights. But uh, a lot of times the structures themselves, um, number one, we're, we're building to a public safety standard, which is a pretty, uh, the most rigid standard um, of the tower um, industry right now anyway. So um, we can usually handle additional equipment on the tower as it sits or as, a, as it's built. Um, and then a, a lot of times we have um, space in the uh, compound below for, for additional um, equipment on the ground. So those two pieces are usually not, not too much of a concern um, in the design process. It's more that height of the tower and if somebody were to need um, additional height. Okay, so the good news is we're we're still at this point asking for less than the maximum, which was the 8.5, we're at 8.1. Um, they're asking us to send this to count. I mean, we won't be voting on it till May. So actually we could talk about it. Oh no, we need to make a decision today and send it on. We're, we're prepping everything with our our bond council and our Moody's reports and all these many pieces that have to happen so to do that bond sale. So exactly. affirmation that we're on track. Um, Are we sending this to finance or straight to county board? Um, it would go to county board. Okay. Um, certainly a report to finance and personnel so they under, understand, mm -hmm. but I don't think they have to take a necessarily an action. Well, they do. No, let me take that back. They're in charge of borrowing, so we would want to have their blessing on with finance and personnel as well. Okay. Um, in a, in a, like you mentioned, so it's 8.1, so it comes in under. You have contingency built into the budget, plus you're going to have about 225 of additional funds uh, that can be appropriated towards this. They can be appropriated towards other types of projects. You still have in reserve then $400,000 of, uh, you could go back for another type of a bonding initiative um, underneath that right. original If this project were to go over, we could, we could go back and get $400,000 more if we had to. Because with we're a, authorized up to 8.5. With a, a major, just a, uh, I shouldn't say just, you, 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 with a majority, with a majority vote. vote. Correct. All right. Any other questions? This is it. This is what we've been working towards for the last, I don't know how many years. It feels like forever. And <laughs> it's just a reminder, too, we're, we're, uh, we've got about two toes left on the diving board. We've already floated um, several different. Thousand payments that have went out towards contracting and we're well down the road. So the, the idea is that we can kind of turn around and walk back down the diving board is not impossible, but we're already heavily invested in this project. Mike, by the time we go to borrow in May, how confident are you that we will know exactly how many towers we need and who's who owns them? Um, I would, I'm confident that we, we will know that, um, my biggest concern would probably be U.S. Cellular, but again, that's just based on the amount of time it's taken us to get to where we are now. But I feel like we're we, we've been we're close, but I felt like we've been close for the last three weeks. I, but I uh, again, like you I told me you were close like three months ago. So, yeah. well, <laughs> even with U.S. Cellular, it's and again, it's it's such a challenge. We're working with their agent, and we've asked for those, you know, that call, but we just. Um, we haven't got it. I we feel like the agent is not, you know, holding up the process, but you just don't know. But yeah, I I, I feel confident that we're going to have um, a locked in design, and uh, and an understanding of of the sites that we're going to use, um, but probably before you're borrowing, probably hopefully by the end of this month. Okay, so can I ask, Sheriff Porter, would you be willing to contact Johnson and Van Orden? And see if they can put any kind of pressure on sooner rather than later. Yes, I can reach out to them. I mean, it can't hurt, right? Okay. All right, committee. Yeah. Um, if you contact you know, them, the, the people above us, um, and mention, I like the Homeland Security angle, and that's big right now, again, with all these documents being released and so Homeland Security is coming out again. And on the other hand, several months ago, we heard we're close. You know, I really would like to see something signed 
this is just dragging on and on and on and and we still don't have any sites really oh that's not true we do have some sites locked in a sign yeah so i have i have a, a signed um tentative agreement it's tentative pending engineering and all that stuff on one property and i have a verbal verbal confirmation on two we'll hopefully have signed within the next week or so I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but verbal still scares yeah. me too because there's oh, no yeah. sign. <laughs> yeah. Mr. McKee, and to add, yeah. add to that, the Richland Telco or uh, Grant Telco folks have also, um, you know, we've got a real favorable agreement with them, and we're really starting yeah. to work on a lease document with them. So we've got those are two two sites in the equation as well. Then the one is county owned. Can it's we not, budget not. for the worst case scenario? And then if US Cellular comes around, we just don't have to spend that money. Well, I think we kind of have with the 8.1 because it was the budget when you said when you looked at the budget without contingency and adding the other things, it was 7.8 or whatever. And so we've added padding in there so that if we do have to build a green site or not, you know, if, if any of these pieces don't fall into place, we we have a plan. Um, and if we don't need that money, what Clint was saying is that you know, if we end up not spending the money on the radio tower, then we can also we've the language in our resolution will be um, we'll have enough items listed that we would be able to buy other capital equipment, like sheriffs to, instead of doing short term borrowing to get our, our sheriff's vehicles. You know, if we had money left over in this project, we could use it for other things. Or there's also the opportunity that you can return it, but it's kind of a weird process, and we're going to be borrowing money short term anyway, so. But so even if we borrow a little bit too much, um, I think that we can still be very frugal in in um, how we handle it because we'll we'll just be utilizing this money instead of other money that we would already be borrowing. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Severson. Then we'll go to Darren. Um, I think try to get a hold of uh, Senator Baldwin too. Mm -hmm. um, I think she's looking for projects within this area, and I know that she's helped out. Vernon County and the city of Viroqua with a few million dollars, so they're able to build a fire station. And I think that she was looking for something in this area to do, but maybe this isn't quite the project that she's looking for, but maybe this she could have some leverage too, along with our other. I think the more people friends. calling up US Cellular and saying, what are you doing, the better. And Tammy is actually more local to us than Senator Johnson would be. So Tammy's only an hour, an hour away. She lives in Madison area. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, so I think we need to take some action. Would someone like to make a motion to? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. I just want to mention with the conversation about the potential of using this for other capital expenditures, is the is there a thought that if you have money left over, you would put it towards subscriber equipment? Because um, another a possibility as well. We know that subscriber equipment is going to be for EMS, fire, first responders, like four hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. And I don't know how much, I don't know how palatable it's going to be if you choose only one of those entities to support and not the others. Well, we're choosing ourselves to support, essentially. Yeah. I mean, that is what it is. We are, I mean, we, we have to provide radios for our sheriff's department. Otherwise, we'd be borrowing money to do that. They no, no, I, I, the sheriff's department, yeah. I'm talking about EMS. I'm not talking about the sheriff's sure. department. I okay. think that's a given. They don't have access to some of the grant funding. So, right. and then with the AFG grant being a federal grant coming out of the Department of Homeland Security, maybe we can make a better case if we make our case together with Senator Johnson, with Senator Baldwin, saying this is where we're at with the negotiations with U.S. Cellular. This is where we're at financially with the county. We also have a grant application in with your Department of Homeland Security. Uh, in FEMA that we're trying to offset this. Maybe we can get some support for that as well. Give them a bigger picture rather than piecemeal it. Because I know like for Senator Baldwin, she's probably got, I don't know, six or seven projects piecemealed in from from entities in, in just in this county that if it comes together, it just appears better. Just my thoughts. Okay. Any other comments? Otherwise, we will need a motion of some kind, one way or the other. To move this forward to county board, is that the motion? Um, to finance and personnel, I believe, is where we need to send it. Yes, I would make that motion. 
And at the, just to be clear, it's the, the amount of 8.1 million. Correct, 8.1 million to personnel. Right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second by McKee. Any other discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, can you plan on being here for our May meeting so that we know exactly what we're going before the county board? Or yes, not a problem. It will be the first Friday this time. Not We changed it because last Friday was Good Friday, but it'll go back to our first Friday in May at okay. 8.30. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. I just wanted to make sure that they could uh, get out of here. All right, so that brings us to item number seven, circuit court judge updates and comments. Welcome. Make sure you talk into your mic so people online can hear you. I'll just be brief. Um, things that follow up and that are of significance probably to this committee. Um, we continue to clear the backlog in the circuit court. Uh, what that means is simply that we're able to resolve cases that are older and have been pending for a while or perhaps too long. Um, that allows us to have more hearings in a more timely manner, certainly uh, makes us more efficient. Um, we've had a little bit of staff turnover. Um, Jenny Lau will uh, introduce this morning our new uh, assistant register and probate and juvenile clerk, and I'll let her do that. And we've also had a change in court reporters. The court reporter is not a county employee, is a state employee, so doesn't really concern um, this committee or the county board. Um, however, it does affect the district attorney's office, as I'm sure Ms. Harper will explain. Uh, just a couple other things briefly. So, as I mentioned, I think at our last county or at our, this la the last meeting, public safety meeting, um, we've reconvened a couple of committees um, that are important and required, one of which is the Criminal Justice uh, Coordinating Council that um, the treatment court kind of drives the, the creation and the continuation of that committee in that the TAD grant that uh, oversees the treatment court requires oversight by the criminal justice coordinating committee. Um, so um, that's one reason for reconvening it. It's meant to oversee the treatment court. Um, however, it is also meant to be a forum where there's collaboration between the different players, different stakeholders in the criminal justice system in the county. So we had a meeting this week of that committee that'll meet quarterly. Um, we had uh, a very helpful visit by Mr. Wendell, who came and set us straight in a, a few areas to help us um, shore up our bylaws and the oversight of the treatment committee, including the fact that um, any kind of policy changes that need that occur in the treatment court uh, get run through the criminal justice the CJCC, I'll just refer to refer to it as that um, in order to do it, in order to have those policy changes um, done correctly, we will need to run them through the CJCC. If I didn't mention it, so the CJCC is an advisory committee, and then we would uh, make recommendations to this committee. Um, we also reconvened the courthouse security committee which is required through Supreme Court rule. Um, we've met once now, no, twice now with the, for the CJCC, and we've met once uh, for the Courthouse Security Committee. We will re, we have another meeting set in the next couple weeks um, for that, so we'll continue to meet quarterly. I'm very optimistic that these committees um, are, are good and will ultimately um, benefit all of us and our ability to collaborate and work together and uh, find issues and off offer solutions to some of those problems that seem to be nagging us a little bit that we haven't been able to get any traction on. So um, that's all I'm gonna really say this morning. Thank you. Another comment? Uh, yes. 
Judge McDougall, with that courthouse security committee, are there any supervisors that sit on that? Melissa and I were, were one of them at one time, and then I gave that spot up. Yeah, I, I think, think Melissa is Maguire. Yes, but you weren't able to come last time. Wasn't time, able so to make that last time. So, What's yeah. the date of the next one? That's right. And and Marty Brewer did come, and he is um, designated as a okay. a member of that committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So that brings us to the clerk of court updates. Of the updates. Good morning. Good morning. So I think that uh, my report can take care of number eight, the clerk of courts part of 15 and the clerk of courts part of 16. Yep. And that's why the three separate reports mm -hmm. that I did for so you. So I had asked uh, all the departments to send us their March through or January through March 23 right. budgets so that we could see where we're at one third one quarter of the way. And then also just the final numbers from 2022 to know where we stand. So the um, the overview, the first part where I have a clerk of courts review of 2022 budget, that's kind of the overview summary and the things that stood out to me. Um, bottom line numbers always stand out. So bottom line on expenditures, bottom line on revenues. The end result of those two is a surplus that goes to the general fund. And the surplus was $37,147. And um, that is um, significant given that we had an exorbitant amount of attorney fees for this last year, county paid attorney fees. Um, and so that's why I charted the 10 years of those. I have to do really detailed reporting for the state every year. That's uh, a requirement in order for the county to get its circuit court aid payments. And so I, it was easy for me to pull these numbers up from the last 10 years of reports. I could go back further, but um, I figured 10 years would be a good mark because a lot happened in those 10 years, particularly in the last couple of years, so between 2020 and 2021 is when the Supreme Court rate went from 60 or 70 an hour to $100 an hour. Was it 70? And so that's part of the reason 2020 back, the numbers are much smaller. Um, and so we knew that those increases were coming we had told the board about them you know we knew a couple of years in advance and um, have always been inching towards increasing those line items but many years we have had to do that um, with a directive to absorb that increase into the rest of our budget which is now i'm just going to tell you it's going to be impossible so you tell me to do it again and i'm going to tell you I will create a budget fiction, like I tell you every other time, but I won't be able to actually do it. And so um, yesterday I, I uh, attended a meeting um, for another committee because there was something that um, I had noticed on the agenda and a, a department that was asking for their um, surplus of money to be for part of it to be distributed to employees as bonuses and i guess i'm concerned about things like that because um just as you're talking this morning I, i'm concerned for this county and for its taxpayers there are things that we have to borrow money for you got to do these you got to figure out how to do these radio towers that is paramount you know and so when you talk about the hard things and prioritizing and everybody worked under stressful conditions and short staffed um, situations. The DA is gonna be embarking on that now. Um, Jen, the registrar and probate, she did it 
last year. Um, I've done it many years and it affects us sitting here and it affects the people in our office greatly. But we understand that we work in public service. And because this is not a business, our, we don't have profits. We have excess taxpayer money, if that's what it ends up, and it has to go back to the general fund. Because there are plenty of times when we have deficiencies. And we talk about crises, and then us small departments get told, you got to cut and even large departments get told you got to cut huge amounts. Um, so that's why, even though my numbers are much smaller than a large department, that's why I give them to you in detail. And I want you to know how that I understand them. And I also understand when a large department, when their requests like that, how it's going to affect my department, her department, her department at the end of the year. And uh, I think it's really important that you guys put the brakes on stuff like that and pay attention when those come to the board level. So what what level did you budget for these items for 2023? Some were, some were um, higher than you were, but not as high as they were this it year? It was, or? well, I, I think I inched them up like maybe 30 grand or something. Like I looked at the, I think I budgeted close to what the um, 2021 figures okay. ended up being. Like, I've moved this number up lots and lots and lots. And... But the good news, I mean, when we were talking about budgets all last summer, I believe you only committed to increasing your revenues by 16,000, was that? Probably because I like that. probably because, because you already knew, yeah. So I mean, I think that's good because then you're we're, you're still you know if assuming you have collections stay where they are. I'm already busting a hump getting the right. money that we're getting, so I'm not going to commit to a crazy amount over that because I'm getting a crazy amount over that. Right. That's my point. Is and that, yeah. I'm not asking and would never ask that that money be those excesses be bonuses for employees if employees want bonuses and they want profit sharing they need to go to the private sector where those are things in the private sector right all right does anyone have any questions for the clerk of court thank you i, I appreciate the 10 years it's nice to look and see kind of the trends and then where we're at um do you guys have questions then about like where we are at as far as our quarterly. Right, I didn't see anything that really raised my um, eyebrows. And, and just a note on that, throughout the year, when you get these numbers, and um, now I'll start showing these figures to you more regularly because, you know, as we get farther in the year, you have to, you know, look at the detail more. But I've been working with Tammy Wheelock up in the county clerk's office. There are some, they've had a lot of turnover in the last several years. And um, so things are the coding of things and the um, the way that accounts are broken out sometimes isn't described in a way that is helpful. And so things like the guardian ad litem reimbursement, which you can see from my summary, is pretty significant. In 2022, $36,000 more than that we recouped. But you won't find that anywhere on the county clerk's revenue detail. Now why? Because it's lumped into a line of, I think, court cost, they call it. It's lumped in with like five, ten other things. And so I said, why do we, you have attorney fees separate, the dean fees that are the criminal fees, and those are separated out in an attorney fee line. Why is guardian at litem reimbursement not? And they're like, I don't know. That's just how it's always been done up here. So we're like, well, we, and Tammy's great. We went through and we coded stuff so that her system and my system, completely different um, accounting programs, but we're making them look like they can talk okay. to each other. That's good. They can't, they don't have any connective connectivity as far as the software. 
but for us as people to be able to look at the them, it's look the same. Yeah, helpful. Yeah. And but since the budget was set and the line items were set the way that they had them laid out before, you're going to see a lot of things like nine 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 after line items because they're going to separate oh, things out. You're splitting them out. Okay. Yeah, that was yeah. I, there was a couple of those I saw, but yeah, you're going to see seventy dollars. So I you'll probably like, see more of that stuff. But then next year when they give like the budget worksheets to the departments right. to do. I'll be able to actually sense. plug them in. So we're going to have a year of things looking weird, but the thing that's important is the bottom line. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. So that brings us to item nine probate department. Good morning. So I am excited to, um, <laughs> I'm going to start out with the good things before first jumping right back into budget. Um, so I am excited to introduce my new deputy register and probate and deputy juvenile clerk. This is Jenny Meyer Keen. Um, so she um, previously worked at the Richmond School District. She seems to know lots of people even more so than I do. Um, <laughs> but I am excited to have her on board. She's a very hard worker and very conscientious. Um, so um, just. And then you have a second person in your office. And I have a second person. In my <laughs> it's amazing. Office. Yes. yes. So I'm, um, yes, much happier than I will have to say. And at the, I apologize for not being here at, uh, last month. I was with Judge Rude, um, who was in a juvenile uh, court trial that day. So that's why I was gone last week. So we still do have um, Judge McDougal is traveling to Iowa County a lot these days. Still, that will continue. Judge Allen is traveling to Richland County a lot these days. Uh, we also have Judge Ryder and um, Judge Rude and Judge Curran. And so sometimes there's um, seven judges schedules that we're looking at, wow. just keeping wow. that in mind. That's a lot. Um, when we're looking at the courtroom use, we do use the small courtroom a lot. Um, I'm just going to put a plug for next meeting. We will be talking a little bit more about the small courtroom needs at the next meeting. Um, we definitely, I feel like we need um, Zoom capabilities in our small courtroom. And there's just some things that have become much more apparent uh, with visiting judges now that the COVID and we, we are still utilizing Zoom a lot, um, but we are moving towards back to more in-person uh, jury trials, court trials, things. So we have more visiting judges than we have in quite some time. So, Is that because of conflict of interest for you that they have to be here? Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> So the bad news is I was in 2022. So first of all, did you get my reports? Yep. You did. Okay. Yep. So in 2022 ended up, um, I was over in um, all three attorneys areas in guardian at litem fees for juvenile cases, guardian at litem fees for um, emergency detention and adult guardianships, and also in attorney fees for, that are adversary counsel when someone's um, opposing their guardianship or if they are a parent in a CHIPS case, um, sometimes they have um, court appointed adversary counsel uh, representing for them. So uh, as Stacy mentioned, you know, with the increase in fees from the $70 an hour to $100 an hour, that is taking more of a toll than I thought it would. Um, we are continuing to scrutinize continuing to scrutinize attorney fees um, and really looking at attorneys, um, how what we're being charged for. But I just want to remind you, we cannot cap attorneys. We cannot limit their representation. We can't limit, you know, we can't ask mm -hmm. them to reduce, to keep their bills below a certain amount. So we don't have any control on those bills that come in, those invoices. Are any of these reimbursable? So yes, we are. Um, we are and those reimbursements come through your office all of the circuit court revenues recorded through my department okay that um when jen's predecessor split the budgets out right she only wanted to split out the expenditures and um so it's a it is 
Because I'm know, curious to as to know how much of this 25000 that you are over was actually recouped from revenues, which there's no way to know because you don't have any revenue. There will be. So that's part of what I am working with Tammy Wheelock. So okay. when we split out um, the, the attorney fees, like that line item that now exists as attorney fees, it's eventually going to be attorney, um, attorney fees, clerk of court, attorney fees, probate on those. And then the guardian at litem, she's going to do the same with. So that would be really helpful because create, then we would know yeah. how much you're being reimbursed. And so the number may look better. Well, may... she, there are some ways to tell it now, just not through the county clerk. Right. I don't want to create, I'm, I'm just, my point is just that you do you do are you are are able to recoup some of these yes. expenditures and so it's potential that it's not really that you overspent 25,000 that some of that was recuperated and in fact it's less than that. right and that that is definitely true i mean there i would have to um get some reports but there's stacy and i talked about that actually earlier this week and uh, we are recouping some of those fees you okay. know, some right away and some through state debt collection yes. so sometimes people come in uh, you know i had for example, I had one lady come in and she put down eight hundred dollars off the top of my head. So, you know, I people some are have the ability to reimburse this right away. Some get on a payment plan. Some right. get to get through debt, state debt collection. Because I think because we'll be moving in uh, way too quickly now. We'll be moving back into budget season, and I think we need to have a serious conversation about making sure that we're representing because we're telling you not to raise your budget and yet we know these costs are going to be coming so i i'm not quite sure how it's going to work with the new the administrator transition and all of that but um but this committee i'd like to have see us have because we had the same conversation about placements over at hhs where we were budgeting something far less than what we knew they were going to be and that it's just not the way i would like to operate so anyway i appreciate your comments about where your budget really is going to be and where yours is as well so all right. Was that? Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Not unless anyone has any questions about the reports or where things are at. I mean, it looks like you're just about on track. You're at twenty eight percent, right? Is that right? I just saw the number for this year. Oh no, you're only at sixteen percent for like salaries and stuff. So you're a little oh because you had an open position in your office. Right. Yes. So that will help a little bit at the end of the year, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um. Okay. Any questions for? Probate. All right. Thank you so much. That brings us to district attorney. There. So I'm going to have a, um, a great thing that's going to happen to my budget. I'm going to be down on um, probably salaries and benefits for a little bit because my legal secretary, who I stole from register and probate, is now leaving, has left my office to go be the new court reporter. Because oh, goodness the gracious. State has the most money and the most stability of right. any of the employing entities around here. So um, I am right now without a legal secretary. It's hard to run a uh, law office without a secretary, but we will make do, although things will be much slower um, as far as being processed, discovery, and all those kind of things as far as getting up to Do the you court. have the position advertised and op it, it, it open? Is, it has is, it is okay. been advertised. It's been posted, and I have gotten um, a uh, application. Okay. So... Um, so I will have that position open for at least a little while in my office, so it will have a positive budgetary impact. Um, it'll have a negative uh, impact in a lot of other mental areas. health, yeah, <laughs> in, a, in a lot of other areas. Um, as far as my budget, uh, before I get to my budget, so um, the the victim witness supervisor um, legal compliance position, which was added, I guess, two budget cycles ago um, this year, now that we got the legal secretary piece put in place, although now it's unraveling right at the moment, um, we've been able to undergo on this first couple of months a lot of policy review, which was the whole problem is that there were just so many things that we were not able to do or look at um, in compliance with Marcy's law and chapter 950 and all those kind of things. So it's really, I think I came here my first week that I had my new person and it's like the skies opened up that we were able to do the things that we've been tasked to do for years and years, not just, um, I mean, certainly morally we are, but by law, by constitution. And um, so we've really made some progress 
with that over the last couple of months is there's new areas where we're like, all right, what can we do about this now? What we can do about that? There's been a lot of training that's going on. So we're definitely getting up to um, best practice in a whole lot of new areas. And that's fantastic. So now we have our legal secretary who is going. So now um, I expect what will happen more is instead of um, I know folks will say, well, they were operating like this before, so it should you know, so this shouldn't be a problem. Well, the issue is going to be is we are not going to let off on our victim services now to go back and just start running the hamster wheel to make sure everything goes smoothly and quickly and wonderfully for everyone else when the issue really is our first priority is to our victims. So this is going to create more of a slowdown than some people might want to think that it's going to. Um, but as far as the budget now, right now, I can advise that so we're at basically 25% of the year, right, through the end of March, and we are, my office is at 20% of it being sent, just as a reminder, 94.6% of our budget in my office is made up of salary and benefits, 946 So um, the one area right now that is not salary and benefits, that is over, it's at 149% of the year already, um, and that's for transcripts. Um, of course, our budget is basically made up of what we've done in years past. That's the best way we can sort out what's going to be happening in years, um, the next year or in future years. And we budgeted $1,000 a year for transcripts. Um, basically, we need those if we're going to have a motion hearing, and so we have evidence, and then the attorneys want to argue about a, um, a constitutional issue or whatnot, then we get the transcripts, we argue, the judge gets to listen to us um, and, and make a decision. We need transcripts, usually, for those. Um, we have uh, baby lawyers are great. They come in and they are just ready to go on every single thing. And so um, I think um, are more litigious when they're younger um, than after they've been around for a while. So I've got a um, uh, one new particularly litigious attorney who I enjoy very much, but I am now up to $1,500 this year on transcripts and it's the beginning of April. And um, so that transcript budget is likely going to be um, up and over for a little while. So we'll just have to see how that goes. Occasionally, the court has been kind enough to order transcripts, um, uh, but it's up to the parties to order the transcripts. So um, we've been doing that, but otherwise we're at 20%, we're at 25% of the year. So awesome. now I will say that my, per well, anyway, we'll see how the budget moves from, from here forward. All right, thank you. Any questions for the district attorney? All right, that brings us to emergency management. Good morning. Good morning. So in your folder, you should see three different documents. First one would be the expenditure guideline report from the county clerk's office and the emergency management budget. And we spent uh, January through March 22% of our budget. So essentially right on track, a little under. Yep. Uh, Fund 49 is the local emergency planning committee budget, and most of that budget uh, consists of uh, administrative functions, so there's no payroll or anything, so we have spent zero dollars in that budget so far. One thing I did notice, and it's on me for not noticing this sooner, um, we, I had, I believe that I had put in last year through the last year's budget process to uh, pay for a portion of heat lights and things like that in the new facility uh, for some reason the categories are there but there's zero dollars that were put aside for it and so now if you look across it's going to be 9999 which means that it's over so i'll i'll work with the clerk's office to see where that error was if it was on on mine or what other than that it's uh on the other thing i guess i would encourage you when you look at this and I do my 2022 presentation we didn't have any major disasters or catastrophes last year in emergency management um, the, the, we have we don't build budgets to be able to withstand those so um, yeah. yeah so your interview I'll keep this short you can look at the packet I highlighted some of the things that we accomplished in 2022 um, when it comes to revenue and expenditures, the emergency management, the emergency management office receives revenue from 
tax levy and from Wisconsin Emergency Management through the Emergency Management Performance Grant. That is funds that is designated to every county and tribal emergency management office. Um, in 2022, they changed the reporting cycle. So it used to be reports and expenditures started on October 1st and went through September 30th of the next year. Um, last year, they changed that. They went, moved it to a calendar year. So they allowed us uh, to include expenses from October, November, December of 2021, along with 2022 in uh, our reimbursement. So normally, we see uh, our emergency management performance grant, our portion of it is between twenty-seven dollars and $29,000 annually. It depends on how much Congress sets aside for the states to deliver to the counties. But in 2022, we're waiting yet for the check. Our emergency management performance grant was $41,446.71. So we had initially budgeted $35,000 or so for tax levy. And after expenditures and everything, we were actually uh, able to get that down to where we only needed $31,000. $522. So there'll be a, a reduction in the tax levy impact for emergency management in 2022. With expenditures, the budget was uh, over by $1,209. I think we talked about that because of the truck repair was the big one. That yeah, there over. was $2,900 that uh, impacted it. Um, but with the increase in revenue, there's still we're still able to you know, decrease the tax levy burden by 30, you know, $3,200, $3,300, which isn't much, but for a department that's got that's a part-time person at $70,000, I'm pretty proud of that. Um, for the LEPC budget, revenues, we receive revenues for that program via a state grant um, and our two state grants. Both of those are funded by all of the industry in the state of Wisconsin that has hazardous materials on site or they manufacture it. And that's divvied out to counties that have those facilities. So um, we total, were we able to see about $33,000 uh, in grant money. Uh, we had initially thought, or when the budget was out, that we were going to need $7,300 from the tax levy. And we were able to uh, get through the year. Um, and we're only going to need $3,300 from the tax levy. So about $4,000 less uh, impact to the tax levy than what we anticipated uh, because we were able to um, recoup more costs in the hazard uh, mitigation plan project. Um, so that grant was, uh, was 18000 And then the other two combined um, for the LEPC office give us this, that $33,000. So just out of curiosity, do you know off the top of your head, like in a year like 2018, where we had one or two flooding events, how much does that affect your budget? Like, do you remember how much you went over those years? Um, the 2007 and eight were probably the biggest one and then 16 and 18. And um, for my budget alone, Probably in the neighborhood of like nine to ten thousand dollars. And there was how many events in eighteen? Just one big one. Well, there was more I was than, trying to remember how many. More than one event. There was four events in eighteen, okay. but one was declared. It was declared. Okay. Yeah. I'm just curious. Right. I feel like it's been quiet. Yeah, been quiet. we we get reimbursed, but the the big the bigger issue I think is nineteen. Nineteen was more of an issue because we were impacted, but we couldn't do FEMA. Couldn't meet the, the state FEMA. per capita. Um, what about COVID? Did that throw us over budget? For 2021 and 2022, we were not. We but were 2020? Able to, nope. No, we were, able, we were able to absorb. So that was a lot of staff time that yes. doesn't necessarily show up yeah. in the budget. Okay. Fortunately, I guess you could look at it. Fortunately, in some ways, we were able to, because of our partnerships built with um, public health, there were ways to offset some cost. 2022, we would have had some initial costs, but John um, provided to all of his services for the COVID response in 2022 pro bono. Oh, wow. So he didn't charge us for any of those hours. Um, amazing. So, and there's just, you know, other ways that we get around it. Partnerships with like 
uh, some of the industry really helped us when it came to PPE and PPE distribution, kept our cost almost to minimum because we built those partnerships. So, I just want to say that I really appreciate how how well the department heads in this room do their jobs and how well you bring information to us and and really tell us what we need to hear. I, I just I do appreciate all the time and effort you put into actually showing up here. So just want to say that. No, I think this is the best, by far the best department head group as far as <laughs> we try. We try. <laughs> we try. Um, but yeah, I do appreciate. It. I know it takes a lot of time and it's not always fun to sit through a two and a half hour meeting, but I I get a lot out of it and I think that that as a group we get a lot done. So thank you. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, off topic. He mentioned, you know, flood in 16, 18, going with these different things. And with being on the fair committee, we've had a fair every other year. So 16, we had a flood. 17, we were able to have a fair. 18, flood. 19, had a fair. 20, was COVID. 21, we had a good fair. 22, no, we had to cancel it because of some rain. You know, a day and a half of it. Yeah. <laughs> totally blew it. Gonna trade uh, in focus. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I do feel like it's been really quiet, so we won't talk about it anymore. Um, all right, uh, thank you for this. Uh, this is actually a very uh, nice highlights. It's good to know. Um, I think it's important for us to understand all the the ways that emergency management is involved in all the different pieces in the county. So, thank you. All right. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Um, that would bring us to PSAP and GIS grant monthly updates. How's it going? Have we have we made any progress spending that money? So for my part of it, which doesn't do all of it, we have met with um, MSA, Todd had a meeting mm -hmm. with us for not the contracted services, but working through. We now have the workflow done, yep. which is a big plus. That's that's huge. And we have also discovered where the monies go. We have started, I have a contract that I believe is now signed for the 244. Two hundred forty-four thousand. I think that's signed. That's for what? That's for our software. I know it is signed because I have a start date. I have a kickoff, so we'll be putting in the software upstairs in the dispatch center. The nine one one. Uh, yep, it's yep. So we'll be all on Motorola products. Um, and the other piece of that was Crossroads. I just got their W-9, so those contracts are signed and implemented. So I think the only piece of my is the ESRI order, and the only reason that's held up is Kathy down in Land Conservation added in that she needed a license, and I don't want to place it. It's not a part of this grant money, but it will be on the same licensing, and I want to wait and do it all at once. So is there training or anything like that? I know that training was a big part of that grant. So, um, yeah, the person who's doing the scheduling and working on that is not in the room right now. But um, I do know that they have been scheduling trainings and, and stuff like that, stuff that would apply towards the grant. So so it's training that costs us something and we can and the grant will reimburse us, yeah. correct? Okay. All yeah, right, so I, you are you are utilizing they're, yeah, they're as you planned on it. And when is the when did this money have to be spent, Brian? We have uh, we have eighteen months for the performance period. First report is due April thirtieth for activities up to the thirty first of March. So I'll probably I have I don't think we've actually spent the money. I have the contracts. Do you want those? Yeah, and then I just need to put that way I can just put in a language like you worked on the contracts here. It the is. The contracts are signed or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Right. Progress. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So probably so next week if I could. So we're good. Everyone is on the same page as far as knowing who's in charge of what. Yeah. Lockwood, Mike, and I are on the same side. Okay. All right. Awesome. 
So I, I did um, see some registrations come through for Richland County at one of the local trains coming up uh, in May. So I'm glad to see that. And just to continue the, the thought on this, um, the 911 subcommittee will be meeting next week on the read on, on identifying the projects for the next grant period. Another six million dollars coming out um, July 1st, as soon as the budget gets settled. Um, so any any needs, any any um, any contracts, anything that you have that support 911, uh, including. And well, well, we'll know next week how we expand that out farther, but start thinking about that because that application will be coming out probably in the next two months does for the that, next year. Do those grants cover like maintenance contracts of stuff? Like I'm assuming we're going to be heading into maintenance contracts for our dispatch center stuff, not once it actually gets installed. That's one of them. And the other question I have is what about tower maintenance? So that is a discussion we're having the maintenance contracts and um, uh, what's what's called SAS um, software as a service is something that we are really pushing on this round of grants something we really want to see get covered um, one of the problems we have with contracts is we cannot the grant cannot pay for a contract that is currently existing but it has the opportunity to pay for a grant that would start after the grant award process begins. So one of the key things we wanna make sure people are doing is in your contracts, you you either, you may wanna do it through your contracts, you get a better rate, but try to work out the language so that it says it's it's month by month, or if a grant is awarded. So a US cellular contract that starts in 2026 and goes for 18 months? There, well, if there's if it's related to 911, there's some functions with that that may be possible. So that's you what know, I'm trying. All our towers related to 911. If it relates to getting emergency services Dis to dispatched to an emergency from a, from a right. 911 call to a scene. So here's here's what the the current grant process looks like. This um, when a caller has the phone and they hit the send button, they call 911 and hit send. To the point that the telecommunicator hits the button to send services, that's where the current grant covers right now. So up to that point. Right, up to the point where they press the button to respond. Because we have a limited dollars amount of money. So we have to break that down. So what we are looking at doing, because we do have some federal guidelines that say we can expand that, that's what we are looking at now to see actually where we can, to, send. to actually say, uh -huh. okay, if they're pressing a button, does that equipment that they press the button on do it? Or do the repeaters that send it do it? Right. Or do the mobile data units that the, re, that the first responders use to get that message, is that included? So we're looking at that picture right now. Right now the limit is, as they hit the button to send them, that's where the grant stops. So um, I, I think there's good movement to expand that um, I had a conversation at the Capitol recently. They're trying to make a constitutional amendment that the uh, police and fire protection fund money um, per con per constitution could only go to police and fire protection. It cannot go to any other fund. Right now it goes to general fund and goes out to shared revenue. Um, that would be $54 million a year if we can get that through, if we can pass that through the next couple budget cycles or the uh, next couple sessions, then we could expand it easily to radio stuff, but we've got to get those things done. So we're we're limited to what we can do, but that is the vision. Better than nothing, right? We'll take, take all the help we can get. Yeah. Okay, anything else on that? I just keep putting that on there just so that we can have these conversations with everybody in the room so that we make sure we're not missing any report ins or whatever. We want, don't want to mess up the money. All right, that brings us to the Sheriff's Department to approve monthly invoices and other Sheriff Department reports. You want to start with the, re the yeah, report? Can start with the, we can start with the invoices. Oh, the, bills? Okay. Yep, any questions about the bills? Um, I do have a question on the item number 10, the meals for prisoners. So when we were talking about budgets, we said we were going to be saving 85000 has that started or did we already say because I was looking at the meals for prisoners at the end of 2022 and it was we did save but it was 25 not 85. 
It starts, it starts at 20, 20, 20, right? Yeah. 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 So is it going to be over the three years or it's yeah. really the savings will be in this year, in 2023? Yeah, that's per year. So the contract runs from 23 to 26. Okay. And so, each year we have that lower rate. And yeah. so over that course of those three years, it'll add up to the, yeah. assuming we don't have a lot of prisoners that are needing more. Because <laughs> I was looking at um, the line items. Well, we can, let's, let's approve the bills. And when we get to the budget, we'll talk more about that. So did anyone have any questions on the bills? I just want to talk more about the food. Oh, but that's, do you want to talk about it during the budget no, or is it is it a question about the food? <laughs> it's not about this exact bill. I mean, that's what we'll go ahead and ask it. Um, so how many meals is it that, that we pay for? Like if you were at 30 meals, you're below 30, we have to pay a higher rate. If you're above 30, we, we pay less. No, that that was our old contract. Yeah, it's, old a, contract. it's a flat rate now. Yep, it's a dollar dollar fifteen a meal, um, four dollars and fifty cents if it's a like a religious diet, um, and then there's a is it a monthly surcharge or or how the? We're talking to your mic. Sorry, I'll <laughs> mic. Um, I it's one hundred and nineteen dollars. I don't know what the fee is anymore it's like a convenience fee or something um but it's on each billing cycle so it's 119 added to whatever the whole bill is just the flat right okay and then some of foods is that that's not grant county jail um it the some of foods is a company but they they run the kitchen in grant county is that where our food comes from is grant county yeah. still yep yeah. is iowa county doing their own food or are they using their summit? summit as well or they were and least. they're not closer yeah they are closer it's i wonder why we don't get it why summit doesn't say hey why don't you get it from iowa county what i know that i i believe they're i believe they're providing meals for another already providing already for a different jail for okay jail, so i believe how yeah. how what is your nutritional needs for your meals that you need to provide to the prisoners it's in DLC versus yeah. Yeah. versus the senior nutrition <laughs> yeah so the the nutritional needs are set by doc 350 and then that's why if we use a kitchen they have to have a registered dietitian that... it, it is quite different too i think we had this conversation when we were talking about pine valley yeah and what the differences would be it would you I mean it wouldn't be a lot different but there's differences between yeah. what the older folks are getting versus what the DOC requires. This, this thing yesterday, we're like, you know, we got Pine Valley, we got the UW Richland kitchen out there. We got Pine Valley's kitchen. You need meals. They need meals over there. Like, why can't we? And Pine Valley needs meals. Why can't we like work together here and get our? We've had this conversation meals? several times, yeah. and so I'll just I'll I'll. And we're paying for a cook out there that probably is not going to yeah. be there in June. I mean, this is maybe this is off topic or off. I mean, we are talking about a bill, but it's probably pretty loosey goosey. Um, yeah, a very liberal discussion. <laughs> um, maybe we should bring because that so we're coming into budget time again. So um, I so I will just tell you from my I mean, you've been on this almost as long as I have. What what has happened every time we've had this conversation is it like the logistics with the UW Food Service because they're they don't work seven days a week. And we could try to make them work seven days a week, to, but it it never made much economical sense um, for that. And the prices that we're getting through this contract service are so low that it's um, it it would almost be hard. But we can we can certainly review that again. Um, we can put that as a future agenda item. How about that? Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, at a dollar fifteen a meal. It's, we don't know how because I know yeah. even Angie for the nutrition meals. Um, I don't know what they are recently. When I was on UW, is anyone on UW committee? Do you remember what the nutrition meals were last year per yeah. meal? Yeah, I mean, she does it for $5. And so I don't know how we could even come close to. And so clearly need to stay within budget. So I'm trying to find it here in the thing. But I think they're going away from UW and they're contracting with Maisel Maney now. Yes. Catering to do food at 640 a meal. Yeah, I, I wonder if Summit find can make their food here. I've seen all their dietitian <laughs> needs. Maybe Summit needs to make their food yeah. as well. Um, okay, so let's let's get the bills approved and let's get back on track here. I would entertain a motion. 
Moved. Motion by Severson, second by McKee. Any other discussion on the bills? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, the bills are paid. Now you want to go to your report. Yes. So when I look at, you know, the number of inmates housed in the county, that does mean, I mean, that's a much higher, how many do we, when you're making the budget, what is the number that you budget for the average inmate count? 25, 30? And we've been up well above that for the last year, right? Well, um, so when you, when you look at that number, um, that includes our electronic monitoring people. Oh, so, and we don't feed them. <laughs> so, so subtract nine for March. Right. Okay. Oh, that I, I didn't yeah. realize that. I thought that they were yeah. not included in that because. So we're, we're doing pretty good. We're, we're, we're on track. Um, but yeah, so, uh, for March total number of. Total amount of vouchers was sixty one thousand three hundred forty nine and seven cents. Uh, average number of jail bookings was forty one. Uh, average number of inmates housed thirty three point seven seven, which includes the average number of electronic monitoring. That was nine. Uh, monthly complaints is two hundred fifty. Uh, say, just simply observing what what my people are doing, um, we're starting to climb into summer, so. <laughs> um, you like I, to give tickets when it's warm out, or well, that and just more they're just more activity, they're more busy. yeah, they're, more people on the road, it's, yeah, it's it's picking up for summer. Um, so yeah, 109 citations issued, uh, civil process papers served 19 and 15 transports for the month. All right. And uh, dispatch activity: 475 calls for service, 91 calls for EMS, and 102 calls for uh, Bridges Center Police Department. All right. Any questions on this report? Okay. I can go into the 20, 2022. The budget review. Budget, if you'd like. Sure. Yes. Let's do that. Okay. Um, so we came in under $41,134.67. So I'm going to interrupt you right there just because, so the deficiency report that just came through, the uniform allowance came through as a deficiency. Yes. I still don't understand why if your whole entire budget, you know, why, why, you know, it makes it sound like you owe, like your, your budget was over, but in fact, you, how much, what was the number again? Forty-one thousand one hundred thirty-four. You underspent your budget by yeah. forty. Overall, you underspent yeah. your budget by forty-one thousand. So I, it, it's still that the whole accounting thing doesn't make sense to me. That that's how we. Yeah. Do. And so, why only uniforms? Because there was other line items that were over. So yeah, there. So there why was, only uniforms were pulled out? I don't know why that was singled out, but yeah, <laughs> and, and, and again, like you said, there was stuff that was gasoline was two hundred. We spent two hundred thirty-one percent of our gas budget. But that wasn't in in the deficiency report, so yeah, I I it's confused. I, I obviously at finance, I need to get them to, and we I tried to get them to explain it to me the other night when we were looking at that financial policy. Yeah, I still wasn't sure it was what I was saying was actually being. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the reports, there's definitely um, overtime. We went over on overtime. Um, retiree. Sick leave, health insurance coverage. But even with the lines that you went over, the overall budget was underspent. Yep, overall budget is underspent. underspent. Um. Okay. So when we so the so I think we should keep track of that forty two thousand because as we move forward with you know because we committed to cutting eighty five thousand from our food service and then there was like one hundred and thirty two thousand of other things. Yeah. Well, we now have this 42,000 that we did not account for. So I think we just want to keep track of that. Um, and that goes for all of the departments. You know, if there's, if you didn't actually overspend, but you had revenues that accounted for some of this stuff or whatever, um, I think as we move forward with this financial plan, although who knows what's going to happen now that there's a new administrator. Yeah. I mean, it could, everything could, I don't know what's going to happen. So, but I mean, from our, from my perspective, I still want to, I want to be, have us, meet what we said we were going to do. Yeah. So if we said we were going to cut 132,000, I want to make sure that we actually do it. And, and I guess I also 
kind of to Darren's point earlier with we're one bad event away from blowing the budget. I know, so, I know. Don't. It's, and, and, well, it, I know, no. I, I think it's a point that needs to be made. Um, um, I do feel like that needs to become a part of our discussion. I yeah. just don't know. How do you? I understand, and I totally agree. But then when you're actually trying to come up with this budget, so we add more there. What do we do? We have to cut a position in order to be able to add some a cushion for event an event we don't know if it's going to happen or not, yeah. which we should do. Yeah. But I don't want to do that. I mean, it's, I don't want to repeat last year with the position, yeah, questionable yep. positions yeah. and stuff neither, like that. Neither do I. Right. So. And I agree. So on the one hand, I really want us to budget realistically, but then when it comes down to making sure all those numbers, you know. That makes sense at the end of the day that we oh no not they don't make sense but that they are actually the old within thought, what we can afford. The old thought process was for like let's say you mentioned health and human services with their um, institutional costs where they never budgeted accurately for that. The whole thought process was well we put it here but the general fund will still have that money and. Then Right, but it. that's what got us in trouble with our general fund yeah. because our general fund got so low right. because we were doing that. And that's where we created that resolution that's now having a hindrance on right being able to do other things because we said we're going to keep this above twenty five percent. No, and then I, I mean, I, I understand the importance of that because I, you know, that was affecting our ability to get decent financing. I mean, it was affecting all sorts of our bond rating, all of that stuff, and we are very heavily dependent on bonding right now. So, um, I, yeah, okay. Maybe Howard will help us out here pretty soon. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? In, um, in some ways, though, if we could just maybe adopt the mentality, even if it's, I know you, you don't want a bunch of funds, you know, revolving funds, but even if there was one that the county board could just well, say, like we're a contingency put fund. In. Yeah, like I feel like the contingency you know? fund should actually be defined as these are the things that we think of that need to be covered in a year where we just don't know. So for example, if there's flooding and events like that, which also affects you because yeah, that's yeah. over time and that's whatever, like you said, one disaster away. So, I mean, maybe that's the conversation is, is we need to make sure that we have a contingency fund that is specifically for the purposes of your response to emergencies and things happening. How would make sense? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah, because I mean the impact the impact to the sheriff's department and highways is huge. Right. Um in and your department. The sixteen or eighteen flood, um, I think it was like nineteen thousand dollars um in additional cost just to the sheriff's department. And it some some and that was more localized to one part of the county. Two thousand eight. If I were to look back, I bet you we were probably pushing close to thirty thousand dollars at two thousand eight's cost. <laughs> you know, to just the sheriff's department and the highways. So, even if we can just, even if the county board puts a little bit in there, five thousand, ten thousand a year, it could build up over time. Yeah. You know, I will write myself a note that as we go through the funding stops on finance, that that we should. I know that last year, I think we removed everything from contingency and used it in the main budget, but um, that certainly seems like a like something we should seriously talk about again to make realistic budgets. That would help because then you wouldn't have to put it in your budget. It would, you know, emergency stuff, which that's what contingency is, right? Okay, so in looking at your um, 2023 budget so far, I mean, for the most part, it looks to me like 19, oh, and just to clarify, 21 percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to clarify, the um, the twenty five thousand in the canine fund that it says negative because the no, no money was budgeted. Those were all donations, right? We had this conversation about it was training for the new dog, yes. and it was yeah. all donations. Yeah. So it's weird to me that it appears as this giant deficiency. Yeah. But it's not. Money we didn't account, account you didn't for as a budget it, yeah. but we were able to do it with donations and grant money or whatever it was. I think it was all, was it all donations? It was all donations. All donations? Okay. So that's, it's just deceiving when you're looking at these reports. I don't know if anyone else, that's a pretty big overshoot, but, but it wasn't. just lost owl. Oh yeah, your foot playing with the cord. <laughs> it's right here, Carrie. <laughs> Who wants to crawl under the table? You don't have to pull this one back. Pull this one back? <laughs> um, one thing I guess I will note, I imagine my mic still works so people can hear me. So, um, they can't hear anything. No, they can't hear anything. All right. 
So our revenue, um, projected revenue for sanctions, quite a bit under. I did see that actually. I'm glad you brought that up. So um, again, I'm looking at what I have for numbers for that. You put sixty thousand in, right? Yeah. As the total for the because year. I'll say we haven't received all of our reimbursements yet. So because what we have tracked in there is not what I have tracked. So there's for. more. There's more coming. It just hasn't been paid. So so there's more coming, but I will say that we're. You're behind. We're behind on that. Um, okay. Hopefully. Because we do so want to try to meet that obligation yeah. too, since we did you said six that months last year of sanctions and we were just over $30,000. So my hope is that, again, things are warming up. Right. I'm glad we didn't do 100000 then. Yes. It would have been a lot of pressure. It would have been, been, been a lot of pressure yeah. uh, taking on. Uh, the other thing, too, that I'll mention that we did not, we did not plan for and therefore did not budget as a revenue was contracting with the village of Lone Rock. Right. So um, potentially that will help offset. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on either the 2022 final numbers or the 2023 so far for the sheriff? All right, moving on. That brings us to, so that was item 16. That you were the last department. Right, but the review of the budgets for all departments is now complete. So 15 and 16, I think, is completely done. But we need to do 14 right now. 16. Oh, no, there's a new agenda. There's a new agenda. Um, item 14 got added, and it's committee approval to hire Cody McCullough to come back as a casual employee. So this one will be pretty quick. Yeah, cool. I don't need approval, I don't think. Um, so change of plans with that. Um, we are, instead of terming his employment, we are going to status change him to a part-time employee. Cool. That'll make things easier for Tammy and um, he'll still get what payouts he would have been given if he termed. Uh, he going? Uh, he's going to the city of Basqueville. So we, yeah. Did we just hire him? And that's probably another another agenda item where we can discuss yep. that issue further hiring process discussion uh, yeah, yeah um but yeah we we lost with the city of basketball he's leaving here as a supervisor and going there as a police officer uh no supervisory and more money pay increase so um so he's going to be a part-time employee so therefore there's no action required by this Body. Okay. So. <clears throat> okay. So item on my agenda, item 15 is review the 22 budgets for each department, which we did. And 16 is review January to March budgets for each department, which we did. So that brings us to item 17 hiring process discussion. Well, we, we do have interviews scheduled for this afternoon. Um, what I will say is uh, we are struggling to find qualified applicants. And that was the point of putting this on. And I know everybody is. I, Jennifer just said she has one applicant for an open position and that's what we're finding is that we are we are struggling to get qualified applicants um even the ones that we do get it seems like there's a probably a 30 percent chance that they don't show up when we need them to show up for testing or whatever for whatever reason um and it's been a real struggle the other reason why I, I wanted to put that on there was, you know, with the jail, we have mandatory staffing levels. So if we can't get any employees, you know, fill those positions, it yeah, just leads to another problem. So I'm, yeah. Well, do you have any thoughts on what, I mean, is it, is it pay, is it always pay? Are we back to that discussion? It's not, it's not like just pay. I mean, Compared to our surrounding counties, like the jail or dispatch, our staff actually get decent pay com comparable. But the thing is that they're doing two jobs compared to wherever all the rest of the counties are doing one job. So I think you that's, mean our surrounding counties. Yeah, yes. surrounding okay. counties. They're doing one job instead of two. I think that's where you're losing some interest because some people are really good at one job mm -hmm. and right. can't do the other one at all. Well, we have that on the Item number nineteen. You know, in in, in respect to the one we're losing on patrol, better pay, 
cheaper insurance. Better um, insurance. Better insurance. Are they on the state plan too? Yeah. State plan. But just, the same just the lower deductibles. Yep. Yeah, they're they're the no deductible sixty percent or sixty dollar copay for ER visits. So um well so what you, what you're hinting at is that one of the ways we might potentially get more applicants is if we split dispatch. It would. Yes. The Maybe. other edge of that sword. The other edge of that sword is we need to employ we need more employees and we're already not getting applicants. Right. So. Yeah, because if you split dispatch, we need to add six, seven, whatever it is. Yeah. And how would we get six more people? I mean, maybe you'd get more applicants because it's a split job. Maybe. But. Yeah. I think maybe. Yeah. Um, so is there any, um, I mean, I know you guys know where to advertise your Southwest Tech. And we put out to all the all surrounding law enforcement. Uh, technical schools this last time. Okay. Anyone have any ideas on how we could potentially? Uh, what I, about I, high school? Can we recruit out of high school? We can. Um, I I do think that we want an eighteen year old deputy, but worth mentioning too is in in it's a topic on the agenda. But we need to streamline our hiring process. We need to be faster. We're not nimble enough. That's well, well eighty nine seven. We could take care yeah, of that. Yeah. Um. So you mean because we have to schedule through you and then through the committee? Yeah. It's it's just it's a lengthy process and the way the hiring market and public safety is right now, if you're not fast, you're losing your applicants. Okay. So. And I think with that, the the, uh, the plan that was adopted in November by the county board that shows departments and what they can have for staff, I mean, that, that really controls. Well, the problem is we have an ordinance 89-7 that specifically says that the law enforcement committee right. needs to be involved. So we have to change that ordinance. Even no matter what the policy says, we still have this ordinance on but the books. It, it come in li it. alignment with it. Yeah. It would that yep. overall plan. It would. Yeah. I mean, I've very for a long time thought that it's just an extra step that's not necessary to have this committee interview because at the end of the day, you make the decision. You might make recommendations, but you let's face it, yeah. you make the decision on who you really want. Um, but so the, the other part is I I mean I I don't know if we can discuss it. I just want to put it out there because it's kind of a topic. And it'll come up later is not just being nimble, but just being somewhat competitive all the way around. Um, as an instructor at Southwest Tech, I'm trying to constantly recruit for the ambulance service. And so I talked to a couple of students that I thought would be good candidates. And then, you know, they come into class Thursday night and say, Hey, I got a job. Oh, yeah, where are you going? Well, I'm going to Gunderson Health Systems. Well, what are they starting out at? $3.95 an hour more than you are, and I get better health insurance. You're sunk. So yeah. I know the conversation has always been we want an even increase across the board. I think that we have I did to bring up at the last finance meeting so. for a future agenda item that I want to talk about. And then there isn't an employer in Richland County that's not struggling to find people too. Right. So and that's and that's the thing too though, and we're we're also losing them. We're losing employees or losing candidates even to other employers that aren't in the public safety or aren't in the public sector, private sector, we're losing employees and candidates to the private sector here in Richland County. Are you, I mean, I think you can make seventeen dollars an hour working at uh, like McDonald's. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr. McKee. Yeah. Um, yes, I look at it as what incentives is there for somebody to move to Richland County? Right now, across the board, we have a housing shortage. So, and I know that doesn't involve <coughs> this group, but I can see it being a problem. Mike. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, so I think we will continue to have these discussions and try to figure out, I mean, as we move back into budget, that's when we can talk about these things, mm -hmm. but I can't imagine that the picture is going to be hugely rosy. So I 
we'll have to just see what we can do and where we can do it. Um, um, <clears throat> all right, so that brings us to committee approval to apply for the US DOJ COPS hiring program 2023 grant. So the, um, I guess, short version of this one, the COPS hiring program, the COPS grant is open right now. It closes on May 11th. Um, looking to apply and request funding or partial funding for one position that gets back to our pre-2010 numbers. Um, and uh, one way that I would help, one thing that would help fund the match in this would be our contract with Lauren. In the first year, is it 25%? It's it's 30? minimum minimum of twenty five percent, but they only give you one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. So for the whole three, three years. years, so it's it wouldn't quite work out to that anyway for a minimum. Um, but our again, we could help pay for the match with our contract with Bone Rock. Um, okay, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but so we the past two years, I think. For sure, last year, mm -hmm. we what we did was we allowed them to apply for the grant, but not ex necessarily accept the grant at this point until we know through the budget process if we can cover the matching. So we want them to apply and maybe, you know, hopefully they get it, but. Um, got denied last year. I never got a denial letter for the year before. I don't know if the application ever was completely submitted the year before that. Okay. So, because I don't want to say that we will accept it until we've gone through the budget process and can really nail down whether we can actually pay for it. Because then after the third, and then we'd have to figure out after the third year, it either has to be wrapped into the, <clears throat> excuse me, wrapped into the operational expenses of your department, um, or it has to be terminated. So, um, I think I'd, when do we hear about, when would you hear if you got that grant? It, would it be during the budget process? late last year I could before September right October it was right around then okay. so I don't know what the committee what you would like to do as far as do you want that same language or do you want to just go ahead and send it through with the approval because it's going to go before the county board as well um or if we want to do the same language as last year I would say we do the same language as last year. We still have to look at the budget. We still have to see what the numbers are, and but I know we need to get it turned in. So. Okay. Would you like to make that into a motion? I will make that into a motion. A motion. Do I have a second? Second by Severson. Any other discussion on that? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Go ahead and apply. Same language as last year. All right, um, so discussion on future jail plans. So I'll start quickly just for, so I, I have been going through and actually looking to see how many jail and dispatch, um, and I almost finished, I'm not quite finished, um, looking through the whole state to see how many jail dispatch centers are combined. Um, but I'm also in the process, whenever I can find information, a lot of times counties have directories, I'm actually looking at staffing levels too, to just to kind of get an idea of how many people are in dispatch for different size counties. Um, I was thinking that um, it would be good if you guys could actually go through the process of just thinking of what it would mean staff-wise, to and, and not only, well, I think mostly staff-wise, but also space-wise, where in the world you would put a separate dispatch center, because presumably it would move out of where it currently is. So I'd like, I think this summer, like, can we set a goal of like June or July where we talk about if you guys can come up with some numbers? Is it six? Is it seven? How many how many new positions would we need? Thoughts on you know, maybe some options on where we could potentially put a dispatch center, just so we have some solid numbers so we can then decide if this is some because we're still supposed to decide if we want to try to push some referendum through. Yeah. For next year, for 2020. Well, it was 2024. I think we kind of decided we would look like it would be 2025, but maybe not. Maybe with the discussions we're having today, this is something that we strongly feel needs to go before the voters. So if I uh, let's shoot for let's shoot for July. Okay. That gives you a couple months to put those numbers together. 
I, I can help you, but I don't know if I can help you. I mean, I'm willing to help you if you need help, but I don't know if I would be helpful. I certainly will get the background information at kind of the state level okay. of where uh, what other kind of comparable counties have for staffing, what the information I could find online. But Mr. Severson, did you have a comment? Try out the ambulance building and see if that would work out there for a communication center. It certainly kind of and makes I sense, would, but I'd like to see my whole vision is that I have a public safety building, right? Have some services combined together. That'd be fantastic, right? Yeah, that won't happen until after we um, pay off Penn Valley. So that's twenty thirty four. All right. Um, so, is there, did you want to add something to that conversation at all? I think that was on here because I said to put it on there, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I promise I will finish that that well we'll we'll just have the discussion in, in July. I'll plan on having all of that information summarized and in iPad folders for everybody. Um, I will also go back through our previous um, evaluation that was made of this building and give you a summary of what what ten ten years ago, two thousand twelve was it? Twenty twelve that, that jail assessment was done? I mean it was the building assessment as a whole, but it did look at the jail. I think it was 2012. Anyway, I'll get all that information and we'll we'll plan on talking about that in depth in July. Okay, so then that brings us to item 20, update on protective status retirement for jail staff. So, uh, I guess an update on that would be Senate Bill, Assembly Bill 28 passed and has been signed by Governor Evers. So, um, that makes protective status and option for jailers in the state of Wisconsin. Now I say option because they can opt in or opt out of protective status. Can you remind me what that means exactly? So protective status is, um, I guess the short version of it is, it's a um, more gets paid into your retirement and there is additional death benefits um, that come along with it or, or disability benefits that come with the duty disability benefits that come along with it. Um, earlier, retirement age. earlier retirement age. Yep. Uh, with that being said, the wording in the bill, and I'm not sure if anything ever got changed on it. I don't believe it did said the employee contribution was the full employee contribution for protective status. And I guess I'm thinking that probably comes back to they don't want to put an unfunded mandate on counties. Oh, right. Um, oh, they don't? Yeah. Oh, that's shocking. At least, wow, at least I, I wouldn't have known that. So. Um, my hope would be, um, and in, in skimming through the language myself, I don't think it would be prohibited, um, would be that the county would look at treating them the same as the rest of our protective employees, mm -hmm. which would be that um, the county picks up the percentage that would be paid to any other general employee and then the employee pays the additional amount for the protective. Okay. 2%. Is that 2% difference? Um, two or three? No, I think it's closer to like six or seven. So it's, you know, over and above, the, over the, and above the, the, the standard. Over and over and above the standard. Oh, yes. Okay. All right, yep. All right. Yep. Um, so right now the general, I think is like six, six or 7% of your annual income. Um, the full protective is like 13% of your annual Perfect. income. So I'm, I would, my hope would be the county would pick up roughly half or whatever the general so do you have, portion is. Do you have an idea of what the budget impact would be to that then? Do you want to figure I, that I out? I don't have it here with me today, but I could, you wanna, we could uh, have it for the next meeting. Why don't you do that? Because then, I mean, obviously that's going to be a big part of the discussion, yeah. unfortunately. But the county is already paying for the jailers, the general portion. Correct. So, so what I would ask is that then instead of going backwards and having them pay the full 13, we just have them pay the additional. Oh, protective. okay. So they continue paying, the county continue paying what they're already paying. Just the difference. Yep, just the difference. And that would be a good number to know then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think, we'll, I think we should continue to have. I mean, especially as we get into budget cycle, let's yeah. let's let's continue to have that but discussion. I, and I don't know how long. Like I looked at the statutes. Um, me not knowing how long it takes it leaving the governor's desk to being actually in the statutes. Uh, I looked. It, it wasn't when I looked. The statute still left out jailers. Um, so I don't know how long we have before this 
um, is in effect and we have to start offering it to our employees. But I'd like to have try to have these answers. Right. Corporation Council, do you know how soon stuff gets put once it's passed? It's well, I don't know off the top of my head. There's probably language in the bill itself, similar to the resolutions that the board passes saying when the effective, effective date is. Okay. Uh, and I can try and pull up that bill real quickly. Um, to see if it has language for a start date. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else on that? No. Oh, oh, okay. No. So, well, so um, 21 is going to be easy. I didn't put it in the. So ordinance 897 is the ordinance that really dictates the sheriff's department and specifically the sheriff department's inter sheriff's department's interaction with this committee. Um, and I, um, I think I finished. I I I started going through it, and I'm like, God, is this? Did I really get it done? Did I ever send it to you and say this is it? It's done. You did, I think, and you had me check the staffing numbers and everything. And, okay, and, and it was right. I remember it being right. Okay, yeah. I mean, I. I thought I remember that, but then I was looking at it, so I'll review it again, but I think for next meeting, we need to, everyone needs to, I'll put it in the folder for the next meeting as early as possible, and you need to really read through it so that we can have a discussion about what, if anything, we should change, which I know for sure, I think we should possibly change the, the us being involved in the interview process, unless someone has some huge um, reason why that they think that that would be a bad idea. I. I just feel like you guys know who, who, you know, you know what you need, you know, in, and watching them interact with your staff, I think is by far the most important. I mean, maybe it's nice for them to be in an environment like this where it's somewhat intimidating. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a big group of people, older people in general, we're much older than the applicants um, to see how they act in a, in that kind of, but I feel like you can get that same sort of understanding from watching them interact with your staff. So I, I think it has marginal. I'd be favorable to having just like, hey, you hired somebody. Here's you just put in here. We had three new hires this right, month. Right, just like one, an update. One, you know, left. You know, it's exactly what they do over there. That they got that form. Just mimic that form. That it just gives out. us a staffing update. Essentially, yes. just give us a staffing update. Who left? Who stayed? You know, who's new? Who left? Who's on discipline? Yeah. So we'll go into stuff. much further, deeper discussions. Did you find out the language? January first, uh, after publication. So it'll be next year so that this goes into effect. Okay. Um, and then in regards to the topic at hand, it, so this committee is involved in all sheriff's office hiring. Mm hmm. It says in the ordinance that the the must be interviewed before this body. Okay, before I'll, I'll hire. get Derek to send me a copy of that. That may have been supplanted oh, well, it's by a, the wait, shift. So I'll send you a copy because okay. what they have is you won't be able to. It's okay. I mean it's just you know how our they were like they changed if they changed something it just wrote the part that they changed and the rest of the or so I went through and put it all together into one final document okay. that I believe incorporates all of the changes to that ordinance that have happened since 1989. Okay. Um, yeah, I can I'll, send that to you. Yes, I will make a note to send to. Um, but wait, so I think we should plan on spending a little bit of time talking about that and potentially making recommendations for some changes so we can streamline that. And then there's a couple other things that I think we could probably talk about why we're why that's in there. I think we've become a more policy driven body in the last three or four years. And previously that was it was more micromanaged. So I think that's a lot of the language in this ordinance had to do with this committee micromanaging. But I don't know what the history of it is. So. There is a history. Whatever. I'm not even want to go there. I don't, don't, it, I don't it, care. It's changed yeah. and things are better. It's All right. Better. So that's enough on that. So radio tower project updates we already did. Mapping radio system squad updates. Um, anything on mapping or radio system? I think we've kind of mostly beat that horse to death, right? Okay. Um, so squads, it looks like got some decent numbers in there where they're supposed to be and everything. Have we had any issues with vehicles lately? Uh, actually, we just had one with one of the Dodge uh, the Durango's, the same air compressor unit. That went a squad. different one? One that went out last year, it went out again, but it's covered at the warranty part, so it'll be fine. Well, hopefully it doesn't go out as soon as the second it's off warranty. Yeah. Hopefully not. Um, so how many Durangos do we have now? Four. Four. 
And this is just the only one that's had a problem so far? Um, no, there's been two <laughs> that had air conditioning problems. Actually, I think the city has theirs go out too with an air conditioner. And what are we getting in 2023 for vehicles? Oh. Maybe they fixed that problem. Okay. But we don't really have a choice, right? No, no, because they aren't, are, is Ford even doing the Explorers anymore? They closed ordering back in August. For 2023. Oh, because we were not prepared to order. I, I thought about doing the ask for forgiveness, but I, maybe, knew, I knew Dodges were going to be still available. So, I just so maybe we do need to have this summer and put it on the agenda to talk about so that you can make the request. Yeah. I mean, we'll be in the middle of the budget process, so I mean, we know we're going to do it. So, yeah. um, just to give us another option, even. Um, okay. Um, that brings us to future agenda items. So, I was at the Richwood Town Board meeting, um, and they were. I was there for something else, but of course, while I'm there, they always bring up lots of stuff. Um, they were are frustrated. They've had three incidents with dogs. And we can't discuss this because it's not on the agenda. I'm just I'm gonna tell you what it is. So they are frustrated because there there's a dog ordinance, which I have not read. I don't know what they meant by dog ordinance. Um and they feel like nothing ever gets done. They've had three incidences where dogs have either severely injured another dog or injured a person or whatever and they don't feel like there's any enforcement. So we can't discuss it. But let's um let's put that on the for the next time so that I can uh, let them know that I put it on there, and then we'll. And I, they told me they were going to send me the specifics of what what exactly those incidents were. Maybe you guys know, but I don't know. And so I, they, I know one. I know the Sedlock case, but I don't know the others. So, um, anyway, put that on for next time. And so eighty nine seven will be on there again. Um, the jail will not. We'll we'll push that to July. So just make a note to put that on July, and. Anyone else have future agenda items? Yes. Um, so, Madam Chair, I'm not sure how widespread it's gotten. Um, I had sent a letter to the Finance and Personnel and Rules and Strategic Planning Committees um, <laughs> because I'm I'm concerned uh, about the level of direction that I'm receiving. I want to make sure that I'm doing a good job and and um, what you hired me to do. Um, and so we're going to be looking into some policy changes on that. Uh, however, it occurred to me that as a department head, I've never given a report to a committee as I was sitting here listening to all the other department heads. Um, and as it turns out, this is the committee that I should be reporting to. Wait, um, I didn't know that. Yes, the other job. Um, so uh, at, at some point, I think there's going to be some uh, di serious discussion about, you know, when my services can be mm -hmm. utilized under right. what. Yep. And, um, which committee reviews what aspects of my job. Um, but I think that given that you are my current oversight committee, you need to be a part of that. Okay. Um, so I'll forward you that letter. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I was at the finance meeting, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I just assume because you're under the county administrator that you didn't necessarily, but that I suppose other department heads are under the county administrator and they report to a committee. So yep. I didn't know that you were reporting to us. Which you don't have to do every month. I mean, this is a little early. Be a long meeting. One department head it never comes to our meetings, so that's okay. true. Yeah. Does anybody actually know where he's physically located? Because I have to find him. Okay. Doesn't he have an office down? He does have an office across the street, um, right next to Barb's office. Yeah. Is he ever there? Is he ever in there? His wife comes in. Kathy's there. Yeah. <laughs> But he's the one that's actually elected. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We don't have a whole lot of control over elected officials though. So I don't know. We can't make him come. Right? I I, I need him for something else. But, no, I know. But, but no, but this is could... this is a question that's come up for us several times. So <clears throat> all right. So I think that's everything then. So we're going to so can we call a so we I guess this is a procedural question, Mike, that I don't know. We are gonna go into closed sessions to conduct interviews. But they're not starting for 20. Oh, I thought you said 11 10. Oh, oh, I must have missed the first. So I saw I saw 11 10, so I wasn't worried. She just, I knew you said he was out there. I'm like, why is he here? <laughs> okay. okay, let's move right in then. So, let's so keep going. Me, I'm gonna probably have to go through some. I can stay here for a little while. Well, there's four of us, so it's okay if we need to go. Yeah.
So far. Okay, listen, I just yeah. If, if I it comes to vote call. before you leave, then so be it. Okay, so that brings us to. We have no one online, so I, I can think you stop do. this, right? And we have to vote on. We do vote on yeah. who we're recommending. Well, when we come out of closed session, we're voting. If we don't vote in closed so session, you'd be all right if I'm not here for. It is. We have four. So as long as everyone else can stay for the interviews, okay. we're good. Okay. All right, so item number 25, interview candidates for the position of the Sheriff's Department Road Patrol Deputy and Jail Dispatcher. And moving into closed session to conduct interviews pursuant to section 19.85, parent one of the Wisconsin statutes. Would someone like to make that motion? Madam Chair, I would ask to be excused for this part. Yes, please. I would so move that. All right, <laughs> motion by Frank, second by McKee. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Carrie, you're not voting because you're leaving or? Yeah, I vote. Okay, so that, I just need a unanimous aye. So aye. Everyone was aye? Okay, so we can go, we are now officially in closed session.